come to church. Tell the person be excited in the service. Because Jesus Christ, your Savior, is right here. Hallelujah. Amen. This morning I want to continue my teaching on holy living. Somebody shout holy living. Amen. And the power of holiness. The power of holiness. The power of holiness. I want you to please turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 5. Verses 13 to 18. The power of holiness. One of the most important reasons why you must live a holy life is because it is the key to answered prayer. Amen. It is a key to answered prayer. It is also the key to the operation of spiritual gifts. Amen. Are you alive in the service? Yes. It's the key to the operation of spiritual gifts. That is why holy living is prescribed by God and recommended strongly by God. The third reason why we must live a holy life is because it is the very nature of God. The Bible says, God says, I am holy. Say, be holy because I am holy. So when we walk in holiness, it's not a denial of what we think is our freedom, but it is for us to pick on the nature of God so that what falls before God will begin to fall before you. Are you here today? Hallelujah. So when we become born again and saved in Christ, we are supposed to maintain the righteousness that have been purchased for us through Jesus Christ. It has been credited to our account and every wise person is supposed to maintain the righteousness that have been purchased for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's a very powerful thing to understand that holy living is not a denial of freedom and enjoyment, but actually it is an empowerment to true life. Amen. Now, James chapter 5, uh, the, what I'm teaching on the power of holiness is the fact that it is the key to answered prayer. Tell somebody, holy living is the key to answered prayer. Amen. Now, the Bible says in James 5, 13 to 18, that is anyone among you suffering, they should pray. So, prayer is a very powerful force. Amen. They should pray. And is anyone cheerful or happy, they should sing songs of praise. And if anyone is sick in the church, they should call for the elders of the church, who are the pastors of the church, and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. They should call for the elders of the church, let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another. So that you may be healed. Everything we have read so far. We've heard pray and pray and pray. Prayer is a very powerful force. Amen. As I've always said prayer doesn't make sense. But it works. And the Bible says, therefore confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Amen. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That is King James Version. Amen. The effectual, fervent prayer. So even though we have all been told that we must pray, when we study God and study the word of God, we see that God just doesn't answer the prayer of just anybody. And we will soon find out this morning, but the Bible says that Elijah was being used as an example here, and we are told that the prayer, after he has said, if there's anything wrong, pray, call the elders, pray, let everybody pray, confess your sins, pray. Then he goes on to stretch it further, that this prayer I'm talking about, that to really bring answers, it must be an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person. Remember the scripture says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. How many have heard that scripture before? 
And the Bible says the righteous run into it, they are saved. It is the righteous who run in and they are saved, not everybody. So when we become Christians, we are supposed to maintain a lifestyle of holiness. I've always explained the difference between righteousness and holiness is that righteousness is that which was purchased for us on the cross that we cannot pay for it. To put us right with God, right standing with God is righteousness and it is an act of Christ. The Bible says that he has imputed righteousness to us. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us so that we can then become the righteousness of God. And when we become the righteousness of God because of the blood of Christ, then the Bible tells us that we must maintain this righteousness by a lifestyle called holiness. And so holy living is daily practice of the word of God, which God has instructed us to live so as to maintain the righteousness that has been purchased for us. Glory be to Jesus. So when you hear people who have called themselves Christians and they are ignorant Christians, say, I won't go to a church where they tell me not to drink and not to do this and not to do that. You have not read the Bible. And it's very clear you have not met the God of the Bible. And you don't understand your salvation. Because if you do, you will not mess it up. Are you here? If you do understand what was purchased for you, you will not mess it up. You, anybody who, after you are saved, want to live any way like the world, there's no difference between the world and you. What the world people practice, you must not practice. Otherwise, you are the same as them. Then there's something wrong with the word of God because the Bible says, the one that is saved, you are the light of the world. That means that light cannot look like darkness. If light begins to look like darkness, then there's something wrong with the light. So it didn't say you shall be the light of the world. As soon as you are saved, you are the light of the world. And so you can't look like the world. You can't behave like the world. Hallelujah. See, when you are saved and you continue to walk in sin, you are similar to the person who has done something wrong and knew he did something wrong, was brought before court, has committed a serious crime, and normally, as in legal practice, they will finally tell you, on the day you'll be sentenced or whatever the judgment will be handed, your lawyers will tell you how things are looking. And they will tell you quietly that it's not looking good. Uh, today, is these things, we are forced, we are forced them, for the best we can get for you is still the death penalty. We have done our best. May the Lord be with you. And they have told you all of this. And then you go in, stand in the dock, the judge sits, reads out everything, and says, therefore, based on the evidence before me, I now sentence you to death by hanging or by lethal injection. Then he goes on to say, however, suddenly you hear, however, someone has decided to take the death for you. And on account of that, you are free to go. Now, who in his right mind will walk out of that court and repeat the same crime? You, you must be mad. The man's family will never forgive you. The earth will not forgive you. Any cat, dog, animal, cockroaches in your house will never forgive you. If you go back and do the same thing, nobody will do that because you will remember the sacrifice the person put in for you. That you should have died and the person allowed you to live. And the person took your death for you. That's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. So we can't come out of that and continue to do the same things that took him to the cross. May we be merciful to Christ today. Amen. Let's be merciful to him. Amen. He has paid a price for us. So the Bible says, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Verse 17, Elijah was a human being like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. Amen. I want to teach you three important things from the verse we have just read in the context of what I'm teaching about the power of holy living, especially when it comes to the fact that it is the key to answered prayer. Amen. Amen. The prayer that we are supposed to pray, number one, the scripture teaches us the type of prayer that must be prayed. Another occasion I will teach on the type properly. But we are supposed to, when we are told to pray and that God will answer, there is a type of prayer to be prayed. And that type of prayer is described as an earnest, fervent prayer. Earnest, fervent prayer. 
Hallelujah. If you look at the scripture in the verse number 16, it says the prayer, the effectual fervent or the earnest fervent prayer of the righteous produces much results. Amen. Now when we talk about fervent or earnest, we are talking about something that is coming from the heart. That is so passionate and demanding change. It is based on expectations. You must have a picture of what you are looking for in, 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 in prophetic teachings, we describe that as having a seeing principle. You must have a picture of what you are praying for. You don't just open your mouth and pray. When you are praying, you must be focused on something. You must have an imagination and a picture of what you are expecting God to answer. God did that with Abraham after he came to him and promised him a son and descendants. And the man was a hundred years old and is wondering how God is going to do this. God told him, come out of your house and look into the skies at night. And try and count the stars. I want you to have a picture of what I'm talking about. That your descendants shall be many. I want you to have a seeing principle. See that picture and begin to prophesy it and declare it. So that when I ask you to change your name from Avram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of many nations. I want you to see yourself as father of this number of people. So God gave him a picture and said, count the stars in the sky. If you can number them, that shall be your number. Your, your descendants shall be many like that. Then he took him from there and the Bible said... He he took him to the seaside and allowed him to look at the seaside and the sand and say, try and count it and see. This is how your descendants will be. So whenever God ever gives a picture of something, he wants you to continue to focus on that with that expectation and begin to declare it until it becomes a manifestation. And so the Bible says this prayer must be fervent, it must be earnest, it must be boiling, passionate desire for change. Hallelujah. You see that example in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. The Bible talks about a man called blind Bartimaeus. It's a tragedy when your predicament becomes your identity. The guy is called Bartimaeus, but the scripture calls him blind Bartimaeus. May nobody describe you by your bad situation. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says he was a beggar sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. And say, now that was a fervent cry. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouted. You could see the exclamation mark there. It was a fervent cry. That was a fervent type of prayer. And the Bible said, many people began to shout him down to say, keep quiet. And he cried out them all. Son of David, have mercy on me. Then Jesus stood still, called him. And the Bible says that he sent for him. And the man threw off his cloak. And came and eventually Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? And the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Amen. It was a fervent, boiling, passionate desire for change. The second thing that we have to learn about the James 5 type of prayer is that the type of prayer itself must be earnest and fervent. Number two, it also describes the nature of the prayer itself. The nature of the prayer. The prayer was specific. Amen. Elijah prayed specifically for the rains. So your prayer must be specific too. It must be fervent and then it must be specific. You can't have generalizations. God wants us to, for answered prayer, the prayer must be specific. Somebody shout specific. So we see that the Bible says, Elijah prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it didn't rain. Then he prayed earnestly that it should rain and that was it. He didn't want to confuse God with any father. Let there be an alteration in the climate. No, be specific. You want rain, rain. Father, I need financial breakthrough. No, be specific. 77 million pounds. Lord, that's what I need. I've been believing God for that. In Jesus' name. So that I can sponsor the weddings of all my daughters and sons in the ministry. Hey, Charlie. Then we will buy church buildings. In Jesus' name. We'll buy a lot of coaches and trains for missions. Glory be to Jesus. And aircraft so that we can safely send Pazamon to India. As I wonder, we'll quickly go to China. 
Reverend Daniel to Japan and Reverend Isaac to Russia. Because the anointing on him is this type of Putin type of anointing. Just go and face Putin. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. We will build orphanages. And every underprivileged person shall receive help. In the mighty name of Jesus. What's the use of a blessing when you are the only one who enjoys it? That's not how God designed it. It must be shared. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So the prayer topic will have to be specific. Somebody shout specific. So just like in Bartimaeus' case, you realize that after he had done a fervent cry, his request was also specific. Jesus asked him, what do you want? I didn't say something about Lord, like pray, let there be some changes in my retina and optical. No, no, no. I want to see. Jesus said, see. God didn't attend the same school with you. Don't bother him with big English. Just be specific of what you want and ask him. In Jesus' name. Specific. And the Bible says that, so the prayer itself must be specific. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do? And it was straightforward. Prayer, therefore, cannot be effective unless it is specific. Amen. So you must be sure of what you want when the Lord asks you, what do you want me to do? If you look at Hannah, the breakthrough came the same way. She passionately went to the Lord, cried out to the Lord, earnest prayer, and she was specific. I need a son, a male child, specific. She was specific. Let your request be specific. Amen. Then the third thing that is very important to the teaching this morning is that the prayer we are supposed to pray in James 5, 13 to 18, first we have now seen the type of prayer must be earnest or fervent. Then the nature of the prayer must be specific, the example of Elijah and Bartimaeus. And then the third thing, which is very important to the teaching, is that the one doing the prayer, the, the, the thing, the scripture describes the one doing the prayer. That the person doing the prayer must be righteous. Hallelujah. It describes the person doing the prayer. So, it can be specific, it can be fervent, but the one doing the prayer is important to the answer. And the scripture says that person must be holy or righteous. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous produces much results. So important. The prayer of the person doing a righteous man, a righteous woman, the, somebody that has right standing with God. Amen. Remember that the scripture told us in James that Elijah prayed that it should not rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again. He was a righteous man and the rains came. Now for three and a half years, there was no rain. There was famine in the land. The economy of Israel in those days depends on the rain. It must rain for their crops to yield. The farming and everything, you need the rain. And it is very possible that both Jezebel and Ahab were also praying for the rain, but there was no shoe. For three and a half years, there was no shoe. In fact, that's why they declare Elijah wanted, and he was wanted for three and a half years. So where is that man who came to the palace here to tell us that by his word it shall not rain? I'm sure when Elijah walked in there, he looked like a joker. Until he walked out and they began to see the effect of the man's power. And they said, wow. Then when they found him, the Bible says that the first request, the first statement that Ahab made was that, are thou he that troubled Israel? Are you the one troubling Israel? One man affected the whole economy by the anointing. When he walked out of the palace, they realized that the guy was not bluffing. And for three years, they realized it wasn't raining. But I'm sure they consulted the gods, Baal gods, all of them. Every totem pole and every altar on the land, from Beersheba to Dan, they consulted all of them, no rain. No rain. Because they didn't have right standing with God. They could have been crying passionately and we know that the prophets of Baal can do passionate prayer. When Elijah came, he summoned them to Mount Carmel and said, call on your God. From morning to evening, the Bible says from six, for 12 hours, they screamed. They earnestly pray to Baal. They cut themselves. So when it comes to earnest prayer, they can do. When it comes to be specific, let it rain, they could do. But they lack holiness. So there was no rain. Until a righteous man comes again after 12 and a half hours. Say, pour more water. And they pour the water. Say, more water. And they pour the water. Say, more water. And they pour the water. And they say, Lord, let it be. 
that they will know that I am your servant. And before he could conclude, fire came from heaven, consumed the altar, leaked up the whole thing. And the Bible says the fire leaked the whole earth, the sand and everything, fire leaking earth. When somebody prays who is righteous, heaven opens. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to Mount Camel and travels in prayer and the rain came down. So they would have been praying for rain, but there was a third thing missing, holiness. Somebody may be praying the same prayer you are praying. Something must change. Holy living. Glory be to Jesus. Look at, look at Psalm 24. So the person doing the prayer is key. And that is the thrust of my message. Holy living is key to answered prayer. We can shout. We can be specific. But the third factor must be combined. They are both essential for the release of the miracle. Hallelujah. Passionate prayer, specific prayer, but you need a third factor. Tell somebody you need a third factor. The holiness factor. Hallelujah. In Psalm 24, the Bible says, now we, we all love the verse 7, but I want to take you into the spiritual warfare type uh, understanding of this prayer. It's not fun. It was instructing the gate. Gates speak. A gate is an altar. <laughs> okay, another time. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell in them. For God has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Is that not correct? Before science came to discover anything, the earth is on waters. Have you seen the globe, the maps of the world? Everything is on the waters. Everything. The Bible says the Lord has established the thing of the waters. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who is qualified to go to the hill of the Lord? Who is qualified to stand in his holy place? Then he answered the question in verse 4. He who has clean hearts and a pure heart, who has not lifted up their soul to an idol or sworn deceitfully. So it's not just everybody who can shout. He, this person, this person, this person, look at the side effect. This person, verse 5. That person will receive the blessing of the Lord. Amen. And vindication from the God of his salvation. For such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Selah. Means meditate, think about it. Who is qualified to stand before the presence of the Lord? Someone who has not sworn deceitfully. Someone who has not bowed to an idol. Someone who is pure in heart. In effect, all those things that were listed there were the qualifications for someone walking in holiness. Amen. And then, that person, therefore, is qualified to issue the decree of verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. It was not a poem. It was an instruction to an ancient gate. When you understand spiritual warfare, you have to understand sometimes you are dealing with gates. You are dealing with satanic gates. A gate is a port of entry and exit. It can deny access or allow access. That's why there are spiritual gatekeepers. There are certain towns and cities you enter. There are gates. It can deny you access. Things can fight you. Altars are raised at the gates. Marketplaces are gates. The junctions, they are gates. That's why some of you that grew up in Africa, sometimes you wake up in the morning and somebody have done some egg and some things at the junction, not any other. Why do you think this just found? No, the junction is a gate. Everybody accesses it. So any curse on anybody through that place, if you put it there, the person will come and pass. It's a gate. So it can deny the person access to life or blessing. Anything can happen. Gates. Gates are important. Another time, spiritual warfare. We will teach on it properly. Altars and gates and thrones. But this morning, let's focus on that. So, lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. I think just, the guy just got up and started talking like this. What are the ancient doors he's dealing with? 
the ancient gateways by which demons access. <laughs> People can be opposed at the gate. They walk through, get into that city and nothing will prosper for them because something is fighting them at the gate. May you be a real Christian in Jesus' name and take charge as a child of God. You can't walk ignorantly on this earth. No. And it says, lift up your heads, O you ancient doors, that the king of glory may enter. And the gate responded rudely. Who is this king of glory? The gate responded. Then the answer came again. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? This is not the first time we have seen such arrogance from a satanic possessed person. Pharaoh posed that question to Moses. And who is that God? Nebuchadnezzar posed the question to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And who is that God? And you see this gate is also asking who is this king of glory? Think it just poem. No. David was dealing with a real spiritual battle. Amen. And he shouted back. He answered, You must always answer. When the enemy speaks, you must speak back. Yes, David knew that when Goliath spoke, he spoke back. Yes, Who is this king of glory? He asked the second time. He says, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. And verse 10, he asked again, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts was the answer. He is the king of glory. He didn't speak again. Hallelujah. The Lord of hosts. He didn't say this time the Lord, the shepherd. You have to know how to invoke God as Zebaoth. The Lord of the armies of Israel. The armies of heaven and on earth. Whenever God is summoned as Lord of hosts, the person doing that knows what he's talking about. May you know God well. And call him in that way. It was David who told us the Lord is our shepherd. But when he was going to face Goliath, he didn't summon God on that battlefield as shepherd. He said the Lord of hosts. In Jesus name. So we see here a setting element of holiness to be able to engage, stand in the holy place. Even to deal with altars and gates of darkness. David knew it and that is why he started off by saying who is qualified to stand in your holy place. Except one who has not lifted their hands and clean, they should have clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. So Jezebel and Ahab too have been praying for the rain, but it didn't work. You must be in right standing with God. Amen. You must have the right to stand in the presence of God without a sense of fear or guilt or shame. Because God begins to work in us mightily when we begin to walk in holiness. Hallelujah. As we went to the camp meeting, I taught extensively on spiritual gifts and how to operate the gifts of the spirit. You have to understand that the foundation to continually walk in spiritual gifts is holy living. Somebody shout holy living. Holy living. The Bible talks about the gift of word of wisdom, the supernatural ability to have the mind of God and the wisdom of God to bring solution to complex problems that are happening instantly. It's an anointing. Somebody shout it's an anointing. But you can't operate it without holy living. This is the reason why throughout the New Testament, believers were being asked to walk in holiness. Otherwise, you are denying yourself the opportunity to operate at a higher level in your Christian life. You don't have to be a pastor to walk in the gifts of the Spirit. You must be a solid Christian walking in holiness. And the Spirit of God who is in you, bear in mind, his name is Holy Spirit. He works best in holy vessels. Amen. Tell somebody, his name is Holy Spirit. He works best in holy vessels. Create the right environment for him. Hallelujah. It's a supernatural, it's that kind of anointing that came upon Solomon. Right there, he was called at midnight and told that two women are fighting over a living baby. One is dead, another is alive. All of them are claiming that it is their child. There was no DNA technology to determine anything. Nothing. And the Bible says they were harlots too. So now we don't even know further. It's not like she's married to her, so we can bring the man. Let me look at your face very well. Maybe this child is yours. But this is the scripture clearly said the two women were harlots. So it could be the child of one of a thousand men. It's a complication, and it's at midnight. Midnight, the king has been summoned. Two women are fighting. Two women are fighting. And this one says, This one that died was not mine. 
This one says, the one that is alive is mine. At that moment, that instant, no prior information, the anointing of the word of wisdom hit the king and he just said, we will settle the matter. Executioner, bring a sword. Divide the child into two and share it among the women. I want to go and sleep. <laughs> one of the women said, yes, I'm for it, king. This is a good decision. Divide the child. Another one said, no. If that's the case, give, you give the living baby to Let the child live. Give the baby to whoever is fighting. The, the other woman, you give it to her. And the king said, no. The one who said the child should live, that's your true child. Because no true mother will look on for the child to die. She will say, let him live. Maybe one day he will, he will know that I'm the mother. And so you want that one to live. And immediately the king, by wisdom, because how would you know? How, I mean, the kind of wisdom that came to the king. May you receive such a wisdom to be able to settle matters. And the Holy Spirit gives us this gift. Amen. First Corinthians 12. That wisdom. Then the next gift was the gift of word of knowledge. And that is supernatural ability to have knowledge of events that have happened in the past and are happening currently. Like what happened in Acts chapter 5. Ananas and Sapphira, everybody was bringing offering. They too, they brought offering. Then they decided to say that for them, how much they sold their house is exactly what they have brought to church. But they have actually kept part of their money. They want to be appreciated and applauded. Sometimes when we give in church, listen, don't give with competition in mind. Give according to your strength. Give according to what God has laid on your heart. Give according to what you believe you will have out of that. Rather than, hey, this will have given 100,000. Me too, I want to give 100 to show. Hey, we don't clap for you for that. Let God know. I don't want the devil to know that you are lying. Please, don't let the devil know that. Amen. So there too they came. People are selling their land and bringing it as offering to church. That's why when people say, New Testament giving, is, is, hey, let's stop tight and let's do New Testament giving. I say, are you, are you ready for New Testament giving? Because New Testament giving, they gave houses too. They gave land. <laughs> it was bigger than the tithe. <laughs> the people that gave me the New Testament, check them out. They gave land, houses, investments, properties. That's what they gave as offering. And when they came to church, they have cooked the lie in their bedroom. They got to church. And the, the man came to first service. He came to first service. The wife came to second service. The man came to first service. And when he came, the Bible says that he, after he has given his offering, I'm sure he gave testimony and said, the Lord has been good to us. We felt led of God to sell our house. We, we, sell, we sold it for 600,000 pounds and we brought all the 600. Not knowing they sold it for 1 million. But they've kept back the 400. And they came to tell church that this is all that they sold it for. Before they could clap their hands, Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Peter was not in their bedroom. This is what we call the gift of word of knowledge. That's why you go to church. Pastor will say, there's somebody here called Ajua. Your mother's name is called this. Your father's name is this. Your great-grandfather's name. You can, that is gift of word of knowledge. We haven't yet started prophesying. So before you start clapping, he hasn't yet said anything yet. He has just described your past. You have to grow to understand the operations of the gift. Many people have clapped because word of knowledge was given. But we haven't yet moved on. The word of knowledge is one level. We must now move to the future. Are you here? And Ananias fell, he fell down dead in church. Then three hours later, the wife came for second service. There were no telephone, no microphones, no phones for anybody to text her to say, breaking news, your husband has just died. So she too, she came to church. And she was just dancing. Hey, hey, hey. She was just dancing in church. <laughs> Peter said, hey, mommy. He said, it's time for testimony. She too, she came. He said, mommy, did you sell the land for that one? He said, oh, bishop. <laughs> the Lord just spoke to us. I don't know whether my husband has told you, but the Lord just spoke to us that we should give everything to the church. <laughs> Bless you, bishop. <laughs> and Peter said, Ananias. He has also finished his work. Mrs. Sapphira Ananias. This your testimony is Samuel. Why has Satan filled your heart? That both of you conspired to lie to the Holy Ghost. 
you haven't lied to man, you have lied to God. And the Bible says, and then Peter says, oh, look at the ushers who just buried your husband. As soon as she saw that she too, she fell down in church and died. Those days, ushers were burying people. Dicky Kofi, you people are relaxed in this church. So they are not just falling under anointing. Some are dying. You carry them out to go and bury them. By the time you return, every other person bring them off. The Holy Ghost has taken them to they to go. They go. <laughs> Gifts of the Spirit, workings of miracles, etc. I won't have all the time, but we'll read into that later. But these gifts, Christians are supposed to operate them. Amen. The Bible says they were given to us to profit with all. And it is the reason why you must live a holy life. Amen. Amen. So Christ was made a sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. And it is the key to answered prayer. Somebody shout answered prayer. The prayer of a righteous person. The person who is walking in righteousness has a relationship with God. You must daily have a relationship with God. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 3. Now we know, verse 19 to 26. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who were under the law. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by their works prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. By now, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. Since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. Effective only through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine tolerance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. And it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteousness and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what the scripture is saying is that when we become saved by reason of the blood of Jesus and our faith in him, God sees us as he sees Christ. We are right in God's sight. And that is why we can't go about living our lives any way, anyhow, like others. Praise Jesus. Amen. Look at verse number 26 of Hebrews chapter 10. Maybe let's take it from verse 24. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good works. Amen. Provoke one another to love and good works. Not provoke one another with insults. With abuse. With gossip. With lies. Then we are told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. As is the habit of some people. Ask somebody sitting by you. Bishop says I should ask you. This is not me. Bishop says I should ask you. Are you, this verse, is it a prophecy for you? Do you fulfill this verse? It, it is the manner of some people. Tell the person, you are talking to the person, until I tell you to stop, I will tell you. I talk, keep talking to the person, it is the manner of some people not to be coming to church regularly. Are you in this category? A bishop says, I should ask you. So you answer on his behalf for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you getting some answers? Please don't fulfill this prophecy. <laughs> there are prophecies in the Bible I want to pass, but not this one. Amen. As the manner of some people is. But encourage one another. Amen. And all the more as you see the day approaching, the coming of the Lord approaching, the Bible says encourage. Verse 26. For if we willfully sin, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Please, you must fear this scripture. 
if we willfully sin after we have gained the knowledge of the word of God, there won't be any more sacrifice remaining. Amen. So the scripture calls us to a higher level of lifestyle, which is holiness. Amen. And that is why we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 20. But the scripture lists certain behaviors that are described as unrighteous. It is time to live a holy life. When we understand why we must not do something, we will walk in that knowledge and understanding. It is better than say, don't do, and no explanation is given. But we are seeing the reason. It is the very nature of God. Holiness is the very nature of God. Now, this is being written to Christians. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 20, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. It means some people are deceived to think that they can be Christians and still live anyhow. Don't be deceived. Fornicators. Have you seen them in the Bible? Yes. Fornicators. Having sex with someone you are not married to is fornication. 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 <laughs> okay, it's another matter. <laughs> if I go there, I will change the subject. So anyway. Idol worshippers. Anything that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. Amen. May we be delivered from idolatry. In Jesus' name. Adulteress. Senior brother of fornication. Adultery. Say, Pastor, is the, is the, the, you see, the feeling, control the feeling. In Jesus' name, control the feeling. Control it. Control it. The fact that you see temptation doesn't mean you must fall. Let the fruit of self-control manifest in your life. May we be genuine Christians. We all pray for grace to walk in holiness. Amen. But Satan will not tempt you with what you don't like. He will tempt you with what you will like. But you must exercise self-control. Fear God and resist the temptation. The Bible says flee fornication. Run away from it in fright and terror. Be like Joseph. In Jesus name. Flee. Adultery is the same. If we are not able to manage fornication, when we get married, adultery will also show up. Because marriage itself is not a cure for sexual immorality. Otherwise, the word adultery will not exist. It means that you can be married and still desire someone else. And but that is why you need to be spiritually disciplined and have the spirit and the nature of self-control to control yourself. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. You must control yourself. Oh, homosexuals. Is that in your Bible? Please, that one is there. It's there in the Bible. It's there. No, Sodomites. That is where all the other alphabets continue from. <laughs> Sodomites, lesbians, all of them. LGBTQWFP. Very soon, we don't know where it will end. They will finish all the 26 letters of the English alphabet and they will go into the Greek. <laughs> Gamma, alpha, delta. Yeah, when they stop. You know when COVID came, they started, then very soon they went to Delta. Yeah, Omicron. Then they started moving. Oh, we have Omicron. Omicron. <laughs> LGBTQWFP Omicron. <laughs> Second. Male prostitutes. I like the NRSV. It's a male prostitutes. Sodomites. Thieves. Thieves. Please don't steal. The scripture reading we read, it said, if you are a thief, stop stealing. The greedy. Drunkards. Hey. Ex 
extortioners. All these things, they, they don't make you holy. It's an unholy practice. None of these things will inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking to Christians. Let's quickly round this up quickly. And this is what some of you used to be. You see, this is what is very important. He said, this is how some of you used to be. That means that he was talking to Christians that this is how you used to live your life before. But now that you are saved, you can't walk in that. Because if you continue to walk in that, you lack power. You lack power. You are supposed to have dominion. Satan cannot fight you unless you yield to sin. You have to correctly interpret temptation. When you see temptation, it's not an opportunity to sin. It's an opportunity to realize that Satan is after something. That's what some of you notice that when the moment we start fasting and praying, that's when you see temptation. It's a sign that something is bothering the devil. Stand firm. I say stand firm. God will justify you. Your prayer will go up in the name of Jesus. Don't lose the privilege of God's presence with two minutes of pleasure. The Bible says Moses in Hebrews 11, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a moment. All these things that you are feeling for this girl. How many minutes at all? How many minutes? How many minutes? Then you have sinned. Now you start feeling guilty. Oh, Jesus. Then you, pray. then you start running away from church for three weeks until you feel a sense of regained righteousness. Then you come back. When you come, you think everybody's seen the thing on your head. <laughs> and the devil keep on condemning you. You start praying and say, hey, remember what you did. Oh, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. We are praying for three hours. We've gone in the spirit. For three hours, you are, you are still at the place of confessing sins. May your Christian life move from this on the mountain in the valley type of life. This sign wave. Today you are up, tomorrow you are down. When we trace your Christian life, we'll get a sign wave. It's just... We want to have one that from the origin, we go right up. Hallelujah. And you can live that life so that you can have dominion. I say you can have dominion. You can walk the devil out of your life. You can walk the devil out of your house. You can walk the devil out of the life of your children. It doesn't matter what he has messed up. When we stand in righteousness, we are able to claim back that which belongs to us. That's why the Bible says that upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. Then my people shall possess their possessions. Nehum. Hallelujah. Check the scriptures. It says, upon Mount Zion there shall be holiness. I think Obadiah 1.7. What is Obadiah 1.7? Obadiah. These are names you should give to your children. Kevin, when you have children, Obadiah. Obadiah Buedu. <laughs> Obadiah Buedu. It's just right. Obadiah 1.17. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. Have you seen? And there shall be holiness. Before the final result, what is the final result? Quick, move me there. Then the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Sometimes we like, I will possess my possessions. No, but there shall be holiness. Then it gives you the power to take back what belongs to you. The devil is a liar in your house. In the name of Jesus. Are we here today? So, if we want to have effective prayer, we must have effective holiness in place. In the mighty name. Of the Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Let's finish the scripture I was reading. Where, where were we? Verse 15 or 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication. Is that in your Bible? The body is not meant for sexual immorality. It is not meant for that. The world may say so, but we are not of this world. Hallelujah. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We are guided by a different constitution in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, and God raised the Lord and also raised us by his power. 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said that two shall become one flesh. But anyone who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with the Lord. 
verse 18. Run away. Flee sexual immorality. Many times in this verse, in this particular scripture, we have been told to run away from this. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But anyone who commits sexual immorality sins against his own soul. Amen. You are sinning against your own body. This is how God sees it. To you, it is pleasure. But to heaven, you are breaking every protection around you. Stay strong. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Don't put yourself in situations where it can happen. Move away. Amen. Flee. Hallelujah. Amen. Stay among people. When you're in a relationship, don't be alone in a place. Temptation is very high. When your body begins to knock against each other, heat will be generated. Feelings will start moving. And there's a point of no return that you are not able to return. Then you will compromise. And say, let's just do it this once. We won't do it again. And you will do it again. You will do it. When the Lord has been doing it again, you too, you are doing it again. You are fighting God. When we sing, he will do it again. You too, you are doing it again. What kind of Christian are you? <laughs> when the Lord is working miracles, we are singing for him. He will do it again. You too, you are working negative miracles. Signs and wonders. You are flexing your muscles. And sister, you have to run away. Don't say, oh, stop. I, I, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like Before you realize your voice is gone. Then you are falling. Run away in fright and terror. In the name of Jesus. Anyone that commits immorality sings against their own body. Hey. Are we alive in church? Uh -huh. Let's finish this now. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is living inside you? You are a walking temple of God. What you will not intentionally do in a temple physically, don't do it when you are alone. Whom you have from God and that you are not of your own. Is that in your Bible? They say, I have my body, what I like I will do. You don't have your body when you become born again. Your body belongs to the Lord. No, you, you, you don't have your body. No, 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 no. The Lord holds you. You have been bought at a price. In Jesus' name. So don't follow the word and say, if it feels good, do it. No. If it feels righteous, do it. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Are we alive in church? Yes. 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 For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Amen. Amen. And when we do this, we create a very strong foundation for power to move things in prayer. So when we gather to pray, you have authority in the realm of the spirit. When you command demons to leave, they won't question you back. In the name of Jesus. I see something will shift in somebody's life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Are we ready to pray this morning? Now sort yourself out so that we pray. Some people think they can shout at God. If there's no foundation, you are just exercising your voice. You better go to choir rehearsal and exercise your voice. But the prayer is going nowhere. The Bible says God's... Nah, 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 nah. Peter, take me to Peter. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know, I feel some release here. Yes. By Wednesday, somebody's going to have a breakthrough. Yes. That is linked to this very message. Because there will be some temptation tonight and you have to overcome it. And when you overcome it, Wednesday, that which you have been waiting for shall be opened. You begin to see a trend in your life and that's how God's power is released. In the name of the Lord Jesus. For you were bought at a price. Now take me to, take me to the scripture. Peter, 1 Peter 3, 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Please, let's all read together. One, two, go. Let's do nursery. One, two, go. Again. Again. And his ears. To whose prayers? The prayers of the righteous. Hallelujah. Uh, okay. Oh, you are. That's what the Bible says. Let's not, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This morning you want to tell God, Lord, forgive me. I, I messed up big time. Forgive me. Cleanse me. You know, this thing, this my flesh. Lord, help me to overcome it. 
in the name of Jesus. Whilst I'm trying to put the fornication down, the appetite for alcohol is also gloating in my throat. I just feel, I just smell the, the, the thing. I just, I, something is doing me. In Jesus' name, may you lose the appetite for the alcohol in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you save all the money for alcohol, you will be able to buy something better for yourself. In the name of the Lord Jesus, may the Lord deliver us from everything that makes us unrighteous in his sight so that our prayer shall be effective and powerful. Somebody lift your voice and begin to pray. Lord, have mercy. Don't just shout at anything. Seek God first. Sort something out with him in the next three minutes and then I'll give you a prayer topic to pray for your life in the name of Jesus before we go out of here. In Jesus' name, there will be a shift. You'll be empowered. Now you have understanding. It's not like we have come and say, don't do this, don't do that. Now we know why the scripture is speaking by itself. In the name of Jesus, let there be a holy generation. Let there be a holy nation. Let there be sanctification in the house. Let there be sanctification in the church. I pray, Lord, help everybody that is praying. You know what may have gone on. You may have not committed fornication, but have you been lying? You may not have lied, but are you harboring some evil in you against someone? Are you speaking some lies about someone? Are you slandering somebody? Are you setting up someone for destruction? Are you burying some grudges in you? People drop all these things. The Bible says these things defile us. They defile us. Hebrews tells us that we must not let any root of bitterness spring up in us. Otherwise, it will defile us. Don't let the devil rob you of prayer power. I have come to release a secret to you in prayer. It is not the construction and the accurate putting together of words that will change the mind of God, but the foundation on which you are standing to make the application to heaven in the name of Jesus. Do you have right standing? Not everybody can appear before a judge. Not everybody that calls themselves a lawyer can stand before a judge. You must be in good standing to be allowed into the court and to be able to stand before the judge and to plead a case on behalf of somebody. What is your right to appear before the judge of all judges and to make a case before him. Let God sanctify your hearts this morning. Sanctify my heart, O oh Lord, with your word and with your spirit, Lord. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness in the mighty name of Jesus. Who shall stand before God's holy presence? He that has clean hands, may the blood wash your hands from all evil, from all sins, from all things that you have meditated on. Like Paul, he prayed and said, I did these things in my ignorance, but I am what I am now by the grace of God. I did them in my ignorance. May the Lord forgive you this morning as you ask him to forgive you. Tell him to cleanse you from all unrighteousness in the name of the Lord Jesus. Any sin that often besets you, pray that the Lord deliver you from that thing which always keeps you back. You move three steps forward and that sin, that lifestyle comes. There are some people you need to change association from because they lure you back to that place that we don't want to be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pure and holy, tried and true.
chapter 3 and the verse number 10 for yourself this morning. It says, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. You know the scripture tells us that death and life is in the power of our tongue. This morning have you sorted things out with God? You want to be that righteous vessel? You are righteous in the sight of God because you are born again. And when we confess our sins, he's just and faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we have confessed your sins to God in prayer and you have asked him to forgive you this morning, then you are righteous now in his sight. And you want to prophesy this to yourself. It says, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. You want to declare, it shall be well with you. It shall be well with you spiritually. It shall be well with you physically. It shall be well with you academically. It shall be well with you in marriage. It shall be well with you in your business. It shall be well in your health. It shall be well in that legal case. It shall be well. The Bible says, say to the righteous. If you are righteous, say it to yourself too. In the name of Jesus. Can you lift up your voice and act prophetically right now? I don't know what you are dealing with, what you are believing God for. But begin to speak. In the name of Jesus. Say, say to the righteous, it shall be well with you. Say to yourself, call your name. Say to yourself, it shall be well. It shall be well with you. It shall be well with you when you lie down. It shall be well with you when you rise up by the power of the Lord Jesus, by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I declare it shall be well with you. It shall be well in your health. It shall be well financially. It shall be well in the relationship. It shall be well academically. It shall be well financially. It shall be well in the ministry. It shall be well in that investment. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Thank you, Jesus. Surround me, oh Lord. Let your presence fill this place. Surround me. Surround me, oh Lord. Surround me, surround me, oh Lord. Surround me, oh Lord. Let your presence. change in their hearts to live holy. That with the knowledge they have received, they will be able to practice it. So that they can gain the upper hand and have all the advantage that a Christian who is walking in holiness must have in your side. I pray for grace for them to overcome every level of temptation. In the name of Jesus, thank you that they will not break the hedge for the enemy to bite them. Thank you. Thank you. Let them lose appetite for every level of sin. 
in the name of Jesus, let the spirit of the fear of the Lord overshadow them and bless them indeed. In Jesus' name. I pray the Lord cause his spirit to rest on you, especially the spirit of the fear of the Lord that will move you to walk in holiness so that you can benefit from prayer in the name of Jesus. May your relationship with God be so strong. May you overcome temptations and may God give you victory. And I pray for the rest of the week. May God's spirit fill you to make the major decisions you are about to make. May this week be favorable to you. You will not die this week. You will not be bereaved this week. You will not fail this week. May God make a way where there seems to be no way. And may God not give the enemy the chance to question that who is your God. May the Lord bless you and excellently bless you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Look at someone and tell the person, live a holy life. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you this morning and forevermore. You are blessed with irrevocable blessings to increase and to influence. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.